Hey what's up guys, I'm Vardy, and welcome to the second part of the Q&A video that I posted a little while ago. So basically in the first video I said, hey ask me a lot of questions about Dark Souls 2, because I've actually played quite a bit of it, and you know that video aired about three months ago, and since that time I've learned a lot about Dark Souls 2, so you're going to get a lot out of this video, but on that video the most popular question has actually become, where the fuck is the answers video? So without further ado, here it is. So, the first question comes in from Sepestration. He says, Hey Vardy, I wonder, did you experience any kind of disappointment playing Dark Souls 2? This is a good question, because all the videos on my channel are usually made with a focus, and very rarely does that focus involve nitpicking about little things, so I'm glad I can talk about some of the things I was disappointed with. That said, very little disappoints me in this game. Anyway, the two things that come up first when I think of disappointment is the travel system, and also just movement. So we'll talk about the travel system first. You know when you light a bonfire it acts as a checkpoint? Well now every single bonfire you light acts as a checkpoint. And now you can travel to every single bonfire, like straight from the start of the game, no Lord Vessel required. So this is a great thing because it really trims down the fat in the game, and I do appreciate it, like it makes you go to different areas and experience them. If you're having trouble with an area, you're having trouble progressing, or you're just sick of the environment, you just travel to a different area and progress there. And the game is designed so that you can go any direction you like. So having the travel to every bonfire option is great because you don't have to go a specific way, and you can just travel there immediately and explore a different area, and that's awesome. The thing that's bad about it is that you don't actually spend much time traveling between bonfires. In Dark Souls 1, you know, you could travel to some bonfires, but you still had to do a lot of walking between them. And in Dark Souls 2, that just doesn't seem to be the case. And that means you miss out on finding random things in the world you might not have otherwise found, and you do spend a lot of the game traveling. But uh, my opinion on this might change as I play more of the game, and there is definitely an upside to it, and the game design reflects that. Now the second thing that disappointed me was movement, and I think generally the movement looks great. I think the motion capture they've got with it looks great, and I know a lot of people say, oh it looks too floaty, but I think it looks really realistic. The thing I didn't like about the movement, um, a long time ago, when I played the beta and a few of the other demos, was when you hold the controller and you know you push left on the analog stick, there was a bit of input lag between you pushing left and your character actually moving left. In Dark Souls 1, movement was really tight. As soon as you push left on the analog stick, you know your character moved left. But in Dark Souls 2, I felt a bit of a delay. However, in more recent versions of the game, it's much tighter than it was before, but still not up to Dark Souls levels of tightness. So while I am a bit disappointed with these two aspects of the game, that's just two aspects out of many, and I think the sentiment of Dark Souls 2 being a great game is shared across all the people in the community that have played it. Like Epic Namebro, I know, for example, thinks it's better than the first Dark Souls, and from what I'd played, I'd have to agree with him. So the second question comes in from Dr. No Name, and he says, How is the jewel wielding? Is it good, as in how it feels and looks? So the jewel wielding in Dark Souls 2 is so much different from Dark Souls 1. Now if you want, you can actually use a weapon in your left hand as if it was in your right hand. And what I mean by this is that your moveset is just mirrored for L1 and L2, just like it is on R1 and R2. That gives anyone who dual wields so much variety. And there's actually another aspect of dual wielding, which is the power stance. Power stance is something you get when you hold down triangle, and you're holding two weapons that are the same weapon class. So if I'm holding two bandit knives, they're both the same weapon class of dagger, and if I hold down triangle, I'll go into a unique stance where I hold them a bit differently, and then L2 will allow me to attack with both of them at the same time. So there is so much variety with dual wielding, and I'd say it's almost as viable as using a shield. It makes your character really offensive, but you get so many different attack options by holding two weapons, so it's a really brilliant change. So, next question. User Dark Souls RS says, Is there a hard, normal, and easy mode setting? Because in the network test, they changed it to a hard mode where the enemies did more damage and had a lot more health. I hope this was just NG plus testing, but it might have been a difficulty slider. There is no difficulty slider in Dark Souls 2. But, ways to change the difficulty are built into the game, and I'm not going to spoil how they're built into the game, but I've found three different ways to change the difficulty in the game, and I've only played maybe halfway through. And from what I can see, they don't just change the health enemies have. We'll have to experiment, but 
I think they actually change the way enemies behave, and one of them definitely does. There's so many reasons I love this more than just choosing easy, hard, ultra mode. It's so much better. You know in Dark Souls there was that ring you could use from Calamite that made enemies do more damage? It's like that in the sense that it's built into the actual game. By making it a part of the game, by interacting with things that change the difficulty, it gives the difficulty slider a sort of organic feel. But more than that, it doesn't seem like this just changes the health and damage of enemies. It seems like this also changes the behavior of enemies. And if you've seen my Dark Souls modded series, you'd know that that's the best way to increase difficulty. Not just by artificially increasing their health or damage, no, by changing their behavior, you basically change the entire game, and the amount of longevity this will give to Dark Souls 2 is pretty staggering. So, next question by Bored to Heck. He says, What strategy seems the most viable so far? By this I mean sorcerer, cleric, strength, dex, etc. So, from my time with the game, I think for the first playthrough I'm gonna go with a dex int build. It seems like the best build, especially for the early game. Because when you use a strength build in Dark Souls, you know, you have to lug around a really heavy weapon. And at the early game at least, you have really low endurance or vitality. You know, you can't roll really easily with a heavy weapon. So while I think strength builds and using heavy weapons will be great in the late game, I think the best thing to do for the early game is go for a dex build. And from what I've seen of pyromancy and spells, I'm gonna want to try out intellect as well. So personal favorite, that's a dex int build. Everything seems really viable though. If you use a bow, you can move while shooting, it uses stamina now, and if you're a caster, you can cancel the cast halfway through, you can increase the speed of your casts by increasing attunement, there's so many different spells now. I really feel like they tried to focus on making every playstyle viable, and that shines through in the gameplay. This next question comes in from the Macox. Where is the answer video? Here. And the next question is Mr. Sketch09. I'm curious about weapon upgrades. Did you see anything that hinted at how this was going to work? So, weapon upgrades, very similar to Dark Souls in that you use Titanite to upgrade. The one major change though, and the thing that I like, is that it's a bit more streamlined now, and what I mean by that is, you know in Dark Souls when you had to get the large ember to push your weapon from plus 5 to plus 6, or the very large ember to push it from plus 10 to plus 11? I'm pretty sure they've got rid of that now, and it's just seamless all the way up to plus 15. In terms of elemental weapons and stuff, I don't know, but that change alone makes the game easier for new players to understand, and doesn't compromise on anything, so I'm glad they took that out. When is this coming out on DS Lite? The next question comes in from Into the Caramel Frappe, who asks, Will Covenants allow you to submit your gifts all at once? As much as I love Dark Souls sitting there for 10 minutes giving one gift at a time when the requirement for rank 3 is 80 is time consuming. If we could place the amount we want to give, that would mean a lot. I'm pretty sure this is in the game for Covenants because it's definitely in the game for Souls. If you have a number of consumable soul items like uh, for example, five souls of the lost knight, you can consume them all at once, or you can consume them one by one, so this functionality is in the game, so I'd be surprised if they didn't apply that to covenant rewards. Strawberry Donut King asks, are there sun bros? There better be sun bros. There are sun bros. Next question comes in from Gagster0301, who says, are strength weapons being buffed or nerfed? In Dark Souls 1, I think strength weapons were definitely in need of a, of a buff. They were slow, and especially in PvP, they were so easy to avoid just because the swing speed was so slow. In Dark Souls 2, they've improved them in a really significant way. Um, the swing speed is faster, um, they're really heavy, which is a bit of a downside, and that hasn't changed, but they do seem better. There's also a new mechanic where if you use a strength weapon and if you up your strength, it becomes easier to break enemy guards. And if you break an enemy guard, they basically go into a repostable animation where you can go up to them and tap R1 and you score a critical hit on them. I'll try and put some footage of this on screen. But this is an awesome change. It means buffing strength actually does more than just change the damage it does. It means that if you were a strength build, you'll be trying to break the guard of enemies and that's a huge change. So yes, there are starting gifts in Dark Souls 2, and from what I can tell so far, there's nothing like the Master Key, although I can't be sure. Anyway, the gifts are Life Ring, Human Effigy, Healing Wares, Homeward Bone, Seed of a Tree of Giants, Bonfire Ascetic, and Petrified Something. The last three are particularly interesting, the others are just consumable items that help with your playthrough, but the last three are interesting. Seed of a Tree of Giants, we don't know what this does, I haven't found out what it does, and I probably wouldn't tell you. 
Bonfire Aesthetic, though, increases the difficulty of enemies around a bonfire. So you burn this item in a bonfire, and enemies around the bonfire become more difficult. So like I mentioned before, this is a way to increase the difficulty of the game. I'm not sure how they become more difficult, whether it's health or damage or just aggressiveness, but the fact that this is in the game from the very start, that's a pretty cool feature. The last thing is Petrified Something. And we don't know what this does either, I don't know what it is, but from what I can tell, unpetrifying things is a thing in Dark Souls 2. And if there was anything I would choose, it would probably be one of those last three, just because we don't know what they do yet, and it seems like you figure out what they do later in the game. The next question comes in from Ultra Combo, who says, Prequel or sequel? It's a sequel, but we do know that time travel plays a part in this game, so we'll see. Stay a while and listen says, is the resistance stat OP in the game? Like if you put 30 in, will the enemy still be able to damage you? So resistance was in Dark Souls 1, and it was pretty terrible. Resistance used to be in Dark Souls 2, but it's not anymore. Resistance has been merged with agility, and now they've become a stat called adaptability. What adaptability does is, A, it makes your character move faster in all ways, so parrying is faster, raising your shield is faster, drinking your Estus is faster, all those things come with adaptability. And the other way adaptability affects your character is with what resistance used to be. So if you up adaptability, you'll also take a bit less damage from attacks, um, especially small attacks like arrows and uh, daggers and things that sort of chip away at your armor. I think raising adaptability now makes it so that those things do a lot less damage. And is it overpowered? It should be, considering all the things it does, but I think they've actually scaled it down quite a bit, so I don't think it's overpowered anymore, but it is a really good stat to have. Don't underestimate it. The next question comes in from Sprek41. Do you know if Dark Souls 2 will release for PC at the same time or later than the consoles? Dark Souls for PC is coming later than consoles. The thing is, we don't know exactly when yet. Um, Amazon's got it listed as May 31st, which I think is way later than it will be. I think May 31st is the latest we will see Dark Souls 2 on PC, and that's probably why Amazon has listed it. I think, based on what the director and based on what Namco has said, I think we'll see Dark Souls 2 for PC a few weeks after the console release. Um, I think the reason we don't know yet is because they don't know. I think they're focusing completely on consoles at the moment and they don't know how long it will take to polish up the PC port. So Michael asks a really sad question, are ragdoll physics gone? Yeah, they're gone. I can't find any enemy in the game that turns into a ragdoll when it falls onto the ground. And this is really sad because, you know, when you were waiting for a summon or something, it was always fun to play soccer with the ragdolls. But I think there's actually a lot of spells in the game that affect corpses, so I think that's why they don't move, but it's just not a part of the engine anymore. So Eito Hater asks, are you part of the glorious PC Master Race? And yes, yes I am. I picked up a PC when Dark Souls came to PC because I wanted a way to capture Dark Souls footage without having to buy a capture card. And that worked out really well because the PC port of Dark Souls looked terrible at the start, but now it looks amazing with mods and just being able to play on PC is an awesome experience. And if you're looking to get into PC gaming, now's a good time to do it because they're really hyping up the PC version for Dark Souls 2. Oh, and also, the game looks amazing on consoles, so I can't imagine how great it's going to look on PC. The lighting effects and the stable frame rate, if they can get that to work on consoles, imagine what they'll do with PC this time around, you know? So pick one up, I reckon. So Nisode Black Knight asks, is it true that you can parry and repost with every two-handed weapon? Because that's cool. It is cool, and when you're two-handing a weapon now, L2 actually parries with that weapon, so you don't need a shield to parry anymore, so that fact alone makes this new mechanic really good. Also, when you hold down triangle instead of just tapping it, you will two-hand your left-handed weapon instead of your right-handed weapon. So, so much variety this time around. So Voxus asks, will NPC mouths move when they talk? It's almost 2014, it has to happen. So in Dark Souls 2, I don't think their mouths move, um, but the NPCs actually make an effort to look at you and engage with you and talk to you and move gestures and gesticulate. So uh, their mouths don't move, but I think they're getting there. All right, next question. Hypersouls asks, which has been the most interesting enemy and which has been the most difficult enemy to defeat? 
In terms of most interesting enemy, I think I would have to say that Grey Knight I've shown in a few pieces of footage, just because I don't know what his deal is. Um, he starts off just sitting there looking really down, and if you attack him, he kills you, and he has this really awesome moveset, because some of his attacks, they mess with your mind. There's one where he just stops moving for a while, and then he does this mad dash at you and attacks you, just when you think, wait, what the hell's going on, he does this dash at you and attacks you. And there's also another one where he dashes to one side, then he runs the other way and dashes to another side, so it's almost like he has these really erratic movements, and that makes him hard to predict. In terms of why he's interesting though, he's always just sitting there, and you do encounter him a bit later on in the game, and he has the same behaviour, so I'm sure we'll find out what the deal is with him. He's actually really difficult too, but I don't want to say the same enemy as being difficult. In terms of the most difficult, I wouldn't say it's one enemy, I'd say it's multiple enemies, you know? When you're fighting multiple at once, that's when the game becomes really hard, because movement tracking is really, really good this time around. Not that you can't avoid attacks, it's just that enemy attacks will clip you, and enemy attacks are better targeted, and enemy AI is so much better, so fighting three at once, that's not easy in this game. Next question is by Ultimia DC. He says, What I'd like to know is, is the lore easily obtained? This is something I might have mentioned in a few other videos, but it's really, really interesting. There's this shallow subplot to Dark Souls, where even just the most casual player will understand what's going on. As soon as you start the game, you know that you're a cursed undead, and as soon as you get to the first starting area, NPCs tell you what's going on in the world. Do I think that ruins the lore? No, not at all. That's what I want. I want people to get into this lore and to be interested in the story of the game, but at the same time, I want there to be this deep subplot that has so much depth, and I think that's what we're going to get in Dark Souls 2. We're going to get a shallow bit of lore for the casual players, but we're also going to get this depth to the lore that makes it really awesome to explore. So, next question is by Eye of Eternity, who asks, Will Dark Souls 2 be on next-gen consoles? And this is a really interesting question, because I feel like even if it was, we wouldn't know about it until much later. Um, it wouldn't be in the best interest for the publisher to push this when the game is coming out on PS3 now, so even if it is, I don't know if we'll know about it for a long time. Do I think it will come to next-gen consoles? Maybe. If the game doesn't sell well on PS3, they might think about um, porting over to next-gen consoles, or if next-gen consoles are really, really picked up by people, then yeah, I think they might think about releasing on next-gen. But, for now, no, it's not coming out, and I don't think you should think about it. Um, if you're looking for a next-gen experience, just buy it on PC. Next question comes in from Goody Shoes, who says, Are you thinking of doing a Let's Play for Dark Souls 2 after your first playthrough? And it's a good question. If I was ever going to do a full-on Let's Play of Dark Souls 2, you know, the entire playthrough, it would be my first playthrough of Dark Souls. And the only time you're going to see anything resembling Let's Play content from me is around the launch of Dark Souls 2. And I think that's just because that's when I see Let's Plays as being the most valuable. As to why I don't do them in general, it's because I never really saw this channel as a really personality-driven channel. I've always wanted it to be driven by content. So, you're going to see very little Let's Play content on this channel, and if you see anything resembling it, it will be highlight reels and really focused content, because that's what I'm about. The Noble Smash says, How different is the invading and summoning of other players? This is a huge topic because it's one of the areas where a lot of things have changed, but at the same time a lot of stuff is still the same. Invading has changed in that you can get invaded whether you're human or hollow. But, that said, don't freak out because there are ways to avoid it. The more hollow you get, the lower the link to other players in other worlds. And the more human you are, the higher your link to other worlds, so you'll be able to summon and you'll be able to get invaded as well. To better cover the topic of invading, I'm going to read some more questions. Zen Daddy asks, does humanity work differently? Um, that's the first part of his question, and yes, Humanity isn't in the game anymore, but it's been replaced by something called a human effigy, and essentially this is humanity, except you don't have to burn it at the bonfire in order to restore your humanity. All you have to do is consume it, and this is a really easy way to restore that humanity. And he says, I heard it was going to work a bit differently. Also, is there a way to make sure you don't get invaded, even though it can happen in both hollow and human state? So like I said before, you get invaded more when you're human, and less when you're hollow. And there are other ways to stop yourself being invaded. Um, one of them, I think, is when you burn a human effigy at the bonfire, that reduces your link to other people. And this third question should really sum up the topic. There's a lot of fear about invading, and Malfisto says, The biggest thing I'm worried about right now is that we can be invaded while hollow, 
Don't get me wrong, I like the idea, but he's worried it will make the game unplayable, as people find ways to exploit it and all that. So his question is, do we know if anything is being done to keep PvP balanced? And it is a good question, and there is things being done. Um, in Dark Souls, you know, you could get invaded at any point by players who are way overgeared and way more skilled than you. But in Dark Souls 2, you can only be invaded by people around your skill level, and the algorithm for invading has changed. Now, you invade people who are around your skill level, and by that I mean they've got the same amount of souls through you throughout the game, they are at the same stage in the game, and they've invaded people uh, around the same time, or they've had the same PvP interaction that you have. So there'll be much less twinking if this works the way they intended to. And in terms of invader balancing and summon balancing, um, in terms of PvP, it's really hard to get a feel for it at this point because we haven't experienced the game enough, but there are a lot of covenants um, that actually affect PvP interaction. One of them protects you when you get invaded, another one lets you protect people when they get invaded, and, you know, this sort of thing is a way of building into the game ways to protect yourself from twinking and that sort of thing without just locking it out entirely. Anyway, that's enough about invading. I'm glad this next question came up though, it's by David Maguire. He says, will there be a hub area, like in Demon's Souls, or will the worlds be mostly seamless like in Dark Souls? So in Demon's Souls you had this hub area where you could go back to rest, level up, buy equipment, talk to NPCs, and then you went out into the world. But in Dark Souls the hub area was intertwined with other areas, and while you could walk from the bonfire, you could still go from Firelink to any other area in the world. So in Dark Souls 2, the new hub area is called Medulla, and you can tell that they tried to capture a lot of what the Nexus was in Demon's Souls, because there's a lot of that vibe of, well, you know, I have to come back to this area to rest and to gather my wits and think about my next plan and level up and talk to NPCs and buy equipment, and they're really cementing this new hub area called Medulla as this place of rest that was more like the hub in Demon Souls than in Dark Souls. And I say that because you actually have to level up um, in this hub area by talking to a maiden, just like you did in Demon Souls. And while you might think this breaks the flow a little bit, it really doesn't. Coming back to Medulla feels like, you know, you're planning your next move and you have this time to rest. And while it does break up the gameplay a little, you know, you beat a boss, you have to go back to Medulla, I really like that change, and I'm glad it's a mix of both Firelink, where it's seamless with the world, but it's also Demon Souls, where you have to go there and rest. Alright, so this next question is by Lord Loudmouth. He says, In the wake of healing crystals, have the developers somehow limited the use of Estus flasks so that you can't simply chug an Estus while the healing crystals work? So, healing in Dark Souls 2 has changed so much that we really have to play through the entire game to get a feel for how well it's balanced, but I really like the changes they've implemented, and they've changed Estus in a way that now Estus, you know, at the start of the game, now in Dark Souls 2, you're going to start with one Estus flask, not five, one. And while it's the same strength as the other ones from Dark Souls, you only start with one, and this really teaches you the value of Estus. You'll never really get to the point where you're chugging it, you know, you'll value it. And Estus is now this in-combat in healing item, whereas Life Gems are more of an in-between combat. But they're also consumable, and they are not found throughout the world that much. So, to answer your question, which I think was, um, are healing items overpowered? No, I don't think they are. You can't just chug Estus and use Life Gems at the same time. Life gems are really valuable, and Estus is really valuable, and you know, you do learn the value of these things through the game. Now we're getting near the end of the questions now, and I think I covered most of the really, really common ones. This next question is by Matatura, and he says, How was the frame rate on the PS3 in the TGS demo? In the PS3 beta test, I wasn't 30 frames per second all the time. With this, you have to remember that the TGS demo was really, really polished because it was something they were putting out to the public, but the beta definitely wasn't as polished as the TGS demo was, and that showed in the frame rate and also the gameplay a little bit to an extent. The TGS demo frame rate was stable. It was really stable until you got to the Mirror Knight, which had so many particle effects. From what I've played in Dark Souls, and that's, you know, the more recent versions of Dark Souls, the frame rate is incredibly stable considering the particle effects and the lighting going on. The resolution isn't great, but the frame rate is brilliant. And I think frame rate is so much more valuable than resolution is. So to have a stable frame rate in Dark Souls 2 is an amazing feat on PS3. And yeah, the frame rate's great, so I don't think you need to worry about that um, from what I've seen. So we're gonna go back to healing for a second, guys, because Alex asks, how does the Estus Flask work? I don't see a plus one or two at the end, and yet it still heals all of your HP. 
As to why it heals most of my HP, that's because you've only seen Dark Souls 2 at the start of the game. You haven't seen it at the end of the game, and at the end of the game, you know, when you get more vitality, your Estus Flask, unupgraded, isn't going to heal all of your HP. But we haven't really talked about how to upgrade your Estus Flask, and that's something that's changed. In order to get more than one Estus Flask in Dark Souls 2, you need to bring Estus Shards to the Maiden. The Maiden will then let you carry more than one Estus Flask. In order to make your Estus Flask heal more, you actually have to burn a type of consumable item at the bonfire, and this allows your Estus Flask to heal more of your health. The next set of questions are by user Salty Waffles, who has three questions, the first of which is, do enemies still have the exact same placement every time? And this answer is twofold, because there is a way to change enemy placements um, as you get to a certain point in the game, but I'm not going to spoil that for you right now. The other way enemy placements change is that now, if you kill the same enemy like 15 times over and over again, that one enemy will eventually stop respawning. There's still a bit of experimentation we have to do with this, and I know you're probably thinking, oh, that dulls down the game for the player, you know, um, it makes it forgiving if they're really having trouble with a level, and I understand why they put it in, they want to get rid of the tedium, but you're going to have to decide, you know, is that too much? Do you dislike the fact that some enemies will stop respawning in order to make the game easier? Um, I think they just did it because a lot of the time, you know, you run the same area on the way to the boss, and whenever I've had this happen to me, it's because I died like 20 times to the same boss, and having those enemies go away was nice, and since I was just running past them, it wasn't that bad, but you will have to make that decision. Is that too easy um, for you. Salty Waffles' next question is about dual wielding, and it's already been answered, but his third question is about crossbows, and it's in three parts. He says, Are crossbows finally functional weapons, as in can they be aimed like a bow, fired while moving, and not have to be reloaded immediately after firing? So, uh, the first bit, can they be aimed like a bow, uh, they can be aimed in first person, so I assume that's what you mean. Um, fired while moving. I think actually the difference between crossbows and bows this time around is that bows can't be fired while moving, but we'll have to see, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. And the third bit, not have to be reloaded immediately after firing. They do have to be reloaded, I'm quite sure, um, to be ready for the next round. Alright guys, last question is by Agami23, who says, How do you feel about them making Dark Souls 2 instead of a new Souls game? And, you know, I was a little disappointed when they announced Dark Souls 2, because I really like the sound of Dragon Souls, or something like that, and I really like the naming scheme of the Souls series. You know, you can change it up, you don't have to put a 2 at the end, all you have to do is change that first word, which is Dark, or Demons, or Dragons, or whatever you want it to be. Um, I'm glad it's a sequel to Dark Souls, because I think Dark Souls' universe has way more potential to explore, and there's so many unanswered questions, so I'm glad we get a bit of finality. So. In the end, I'm really glad they made Dark Souls 2. Alright, that does it for me for the day, guys. If you have a question that wasn't answered, and that's pretty likely considering there were 5,000 of them, just leave it below. Um, I'll be answering the questions in this comment section pretty much exclusively over the next few days, so just leave it there if you had a question. Other than that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.